Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for staying to the last talk of the day. Uh, my name is Eduardo. Uh, I work at, uh, as a CTO at Packlink. And I'm here today to talk about uh, our experience migrating our cloud provider. Um, well, as any good story, it starts a long time ago, uh, roughly two years ago. And two years ago, there was Packlink, a shipping services reseller. Uh, Packlink was available in four countries. Uh, we had 900 requests per minute on average, with some peaks at 3,000 requests per minute. A small engineering team uh, with microservices using Docker and non-native Docker Swarm since 2015, kind of a bleeding edge uh, stuff back then. Um, we're living in a mid-sized um, cloud provider. There were no vendor lock-in, for better or worse. As a mid-sized provider, there were not so much uh, managed services. Uh, we were connecting more than 20 European carriers back then. Now we are around 30 or more. Uh, of course, Backlink had some virtual machines to take care of. Uh, there were more than 200 virtual machines at the time. Uh, production was a snowflake. That is, production was all uh, handmade and, and, and one by one. So uh, they were all pets, our service in production. Sorry. Um, we had an emerging DevOps culture. There were pet and snowflake servers, not only in production, but in the rest of our environments. Sorry. Uh, we had full documentation of all the processes, manual creation of servers, of course. And um, our station environments took more than a week to recreate. Uh, now, I want to make a small aside here uh, to give you more context. At Packling, we work with three levels of environments, of course, local environment for development, uh, middle-level environment we could call station or testing, and then production. So these middle environments that sometimes we need uh, to have more or less, uh, depending on our needs, uh, were that those taking, taking around, around a week. And we had only one data center and only one availability zone in the provider that uh, we were using at the time. So roughly, so roughly our infrastructure looked like this. A couple of Front-end applications, our API gateway, all of our microservices were uh, living in this non-native Docker Swarm no, um, cluster. And we were using uh, HashiCorp's console uh, for DNS, service discovery, and uh, configuration. So we took a step back. Um, we looked uh, what we had at the time. Um, back then, I think it was a couple of months since, um, since Keith Morris took this infrastructure as codebook. Uh, so we decided uh, to go the infrastructure path, and this, had, this decision had a consequence that we'll, we'll uh, see later on. So we went through the uh, infrastructure brick, uh, yellow brick path, and the first thing uh, when following this path was to clean the house. Uh, so to clean the house, we first had to know what we had in our house. So uh, we first did an inventory with Ansible of all of our servers, those more than 200 machines. And uh, we were following um, a kind of a scorched earth strategy. This means that if we were to find a server with a machine that we were not aware of its existence, or, uh, or if we didn't know uh, what it was doing, we will turn it off, uh, wait a couple of days or three, if no alerting, uh, uh, nobody was screaming, uh, we will re uh, remove it from the, uh, from the inventory, and, and there it goes. So all this work, uh, it was like three or four months of work, um, took us to reduce by 25% uh, the amount of virtual machines that we had in production. That's a ton of machines that we were having there for nothing. Well, maybe at some point they were doing something, but they became useless. Um, so automation is part of this cleaning and uh, part of um, you know, working in a more effective way. So uh, as I said, we were using console for configurations. And uh, console has a really nice user interface where you can put uh, manually your configurations. Of course, this has a huge problem. Your configurations are not consistent. You do not know which configurations you have at which, at which point in time. So we actually uh, develop a um, small Slack bot that will uh, translate Toml to 
consuls, uh, um, keys, and, and values, and make that a deployable configuration bot. So now we have configurations as part of, uh, of a repository where we could have branches, versions, and that saved a lot of time, a lot of problems that we're having uh, by, uh, by using manual configurations um, in console. Um, the last step uh, on this cleanup that we did on, on all of our systems was, um, was to use, um, sorry, again, uh, to use traffic, a traffic cluster instead of our uh, custom load balancing for our, um, our microservices. And uh, we started using traffic with console as the, um, as the, as the storage for um, uh, the catalog of, uh, of routes. So then every time we update or we create a new, a new Docker into the, into the cluster, it will, go into, it will go into console and console tags. And then uh, traffic will read from there and update all the routes. So um, with, with all this, with all this, uh, all this work we did, was roughly, yeah, five months of work, we actually achieved a really interesting cost reduction. Uh, it's a nice randomization over there. Um, but more important than this is that we were doing more with less, because if you remember, this was our previous infrastructure. Today we had a traffic cluster, a Slack for configuration, a couple of other things, and we were actually paying less money, and we were actually um, uh, taking less time into maintenance. With all this in place, it came the, the consequence of following this path, and that was it was time to find a new cloud provider. And this is because our current provider was, was small, and there ha it has some shortcomings. Sorry. Now, to find a new provider, first you need to be sure, or at least know a little bit, uh, what do you expect from your new provider. So we made a list of the things we were looking for. We are looking for a programmable API, a uh, thing that we didn't have. We are looking to use existing, tool, existing tools that support um, that, that uh, provider's API, like Terraform or CloudFormation. We were looking for security groups, looking for more availability zones, looking to achieve a lift and shift strategy that is just you know, taking what we had and putting that in, in the new provider. And uh, we uh, wanted to allow us, this provider, to leverage all the benefits of infrastructure as code. But we not only had requirements, uh, we had some limitations that we, were, uh, that we need to overcome uh, while migrating uh, to this new provider. And these limitations were uh, that we couldn't allow us ourselves to make software changes in our microservices. Uh, remember, uh, Packlin back in the time had a small team, so uh, having to change any number of microservices um, uh, software to add any other service from the new provider was not a possibility. Uh, we had a restricted time window. Uh, packing has a really high seasonality in terms of, of business. Um, so our time window was July 2018. And if we were to miss that window, the next window would, be, uh, would have been July 2019. Uh, spoiler alert, we made it on time because I'm here. Um, so next thing was we had a limited budget. Uh, this is twofold here. Mainly, um, we, had, we were looking to keep our expense level in terms of uh, our production environments on, and the station environments, mainly. And the second is uh, we were going to replicate production in this new provider. So we were going to be expending uh, you know, uh, almost double uh, for a couple of months, maybe, so we needed to have that into, into account. And we had an ops dedicated team, sometimes. That is, again, we were a small team, and we were, lowing, we were going to lock this ops, ops team into uh, migrating the provider, but they still had to um, do some, or give some service to the, to the rest of the engineering team. 
So with our requirements and our limitations, we took a look at the landscape of uh, cloud providers at the moment. So we had to choose, see any, many, should I choose Azure, should I choose plat cloud platform, AWS. But sadly, this is December 2017, so sorry, Microsoft, you were not part of the picture. So we're looking to Google Cloud Platform, we're looking to AWS. Google Cloud was the new kid in the block back then. Um, and AWS, of course, they have all the toys, so they were really mature. Um, so we started researching. And the first thing we encountered with that cloud providers, they always advise you to work with a partner. Now, uh, looking for a partner, we are talking here Q1 to 18. It means um, for us that they were not ready to support us on automation. We were looking to go fully infrastructure as code. So we wanted a partner to help us on code. We didn't want a cloud architect. We didn't want point and click. We wanted code. And this was not the case uh, then. So we needed to assume that it was only going to be a pure effort of the, of the team here. So we had a restricted time because we are already Q1, that's let's say January 2018. We are aiming for July 2018. We have a restricted time. We had the people we have. We did some research. And well, network infrastructure, clarity in pricing, and help from Google account managers turned the odds to choose Google Cloud Platform. And with all this, uh, having our house uh, kind of clean up, knowing what we have, having to choose a new home for our, uh, all of our infrastructure, it was time for calling the infrastructure. Um, we had some, we, so to call the whole thing into existence, we needed to choose a, a tool. And we choose Terraform for this. And after choosing the tool, we had to set a first objective. Where do we want to go? In, uh, uh, of course, we want to change provider, but there is some middle steps we, we have to take. So we set up an objective, and this is having a, work, a working station environment in the new provider. We did this, uh, we took this decision because um, an station environment is pretty much like production, and our, the rest of the engineering team are using this, this environment. So they will help us flesh, flesh out all the um, corners and all the edge cases that our environments could have. Uh, would be a really valuable feedback. So getting to that objective was not easy. We encountered a couple of couple of um, obstacles uh, along the way. The first one was how to handle Ansible roles on ephemeral machines and IPs. Remember, our previous provider, our virtual machines were all like PET, and all, all snowflakes, all manual. So we had all the information needed for Ansible to, to provision. So we needed a way to solve the dynamic inventory uh, problem. And we did this using uh, GCP's network tags to map machines' roles into Ansible groups, uh, actually making, uh, making a really clever decision. Uh, uh, here is basically, what's the role? What's going to be doing this machine? And with that, I will get the, the uh, corresponding provisioning. So within that, basically, Terraform will create the tags, will create the virtual machine with tags in, in Google Cloud Platform with uh, calls similar, uh, similar to this one. Once the, once the ma virtual machine is there with the tags, Ansible Inventor will read these tags, will map to groups, and will actually provision the machine uh, that we just, we just created. So this solves all the, all the issues with uh, our dynamic in inventory. Um, but having dynamic uh, virtual machines uh, had another, another issue for us. Uh, sorry, that comes later. Uh, so also, we had a VPN concentrator. We had to connect to our environment for a VPN. On uh, our previous provider, on, only one availability zone, only one VPN, everything's fine. Uh, but uh, on our new provider, we had multiple availability zones, uh, triggering the possibility of having multi-VPNs 
uh, that's not kind of scalable. So we took a decision. We bring the virtual uh, the VPN connector concentrator, sorry, into our office, and we'll connect to the office and from the office to the different environments. Um, as I said before, we had now um, ephemeral virtual machines. This was a more dynamic environment, but we work with, uh, with, work with logistical carriers. And carriers, uh, sometimes, they require you to have a, um, your IP whitelisted. Now, this, this is a problem because uh, if you want to scale the microservices connecting to the carriers, um, you cannot scale dynamically. You cannot scale at any, in any node of your, of your cluster because it will, it's going to have a different IP. Um, so we solved the problem of having one, only one IP to be able to provide this to, our, uh, to, our, to the carriers. We solved this by implementing an add gateway for any external connection of our microservices. And this allowed us to give one IP to, to all of the carriers that were requesting uh, requesting this. Now, the NAT gateway uh, uh, took us to another problem. And this, was, this problem was triggered by this bleeding edge uh, technology called FTP. You maybe know it. So yes, carriers, they use FTP uh, for a lot of things. So we had to solve the problem that urban connections were lost when going through the FTP. Luckily, uh, they were not requesting uh, um, whitelisted IPs for connecting to an FTP, so we basically bypassed the gateway when connecting to an FTP. So we stopped using the, the, gate, the NAT gateway for SCPs. We use it for all the rest of the things. Um, and one more thing that we had to overcome, we had at the moment, um, at that time, uh, our custom-made logs infrastructure. So we had to solve the problem of sending roughly 10 gigabytes of logs per day to somewhere uh, for them to be useful. Um, so to solve this, uh, previously, previously we had Docker sending uh, all our logs through FluentD to Elasticsearch. And um, so basically we removed this, we removed uh, Elasticsearch from the equation. And we added Stackdriver uh, from, from Google. Uh, the important thing here is that we didn't have to um, and do any changes in the microservices. Uh, Fluentd is an, an external element to them. Um, so this was, this was transparent. And if we were needing to do some more uh, complex queries, we were to send that to Google BigQuery. So once we uh, passed all these, uh, all these uh, obstacles along the way. We finally made it. We had our first milestone achieved, and was basically having our station environments to run in GCP. Um, however, that, that was not everything. Now, uh, the engineering team was testing these environments by, use, by using them um, Every, every single day for any new features that we were developing, development, develop, yeah, sorry, developing and um, any bug fixing. Uh, so um, once we fleshed out all the, all the details and, and basically add, adding some more resources into, into what we made for staging, we actually had production in GCP. We replicated. Um, our, our whole of our infrastructure in GCP, and we did it more than, than a month in advance of what we thought it was going to be, which was really uh, remarkable and gave us a lot of time uh, to continue to flesh out some, some more details and test our applications and see that everything was, was working. Um, however, the best was yet to come. Uh, we were happily uh, cheering because all of our infrastructure was coded when suddenly databases came to play. So yes, we are going to talk about database migrations, data migration, that's an amazing topic. Um, so Packling, at Packling, we use MongoDB, Elasticsearch, uh, Percona server for MySQL, Redis, kind of a pretty standard uh, stack of databases. All of these uh, were more or less 487 
gigabytes of information that we had to move from, from uh, this provider to our new home. So we needed to look for uh, different strategies to do this. Uh, so the, thing, the first strategy that, we're, that we'll take a look into was, of course, backup and restore. Uh, so it basically works for every database that we had. Yes, we, uh, we were and we are doing backups, and we are restoring them, so we know they work. But this has a really, really huge problem. It's very time consuming, and it's 100% offline. So it works, but it will take us into massive time of downtime. So we were looking for options, and we discovered Cloud Endure. Cloud Endure is a, it's a service from, uh, from GCP that allows you to clone a machine in another provider into GCP. Uh, it worked for every single database. That was amazing. But it had a really big drawback, and, it had, and it's that it has a really heavy restrictions in virtual machine creation, uh, mainly on, on the network interfaces. And this was key for us. So it doesn't look like a tool that we could use. And third, we take a look at rsync, because we thought, hey, why not? We can rsync live all of our databases. So we, we, we give it a try, and it worked for Redis. It worked for Percona. It worked for Elasticsearch. We were almost there until MongoDB came and said no. Uh, so while I was syncing the MongoDB cluster, there were some problems with the sharding and how the data was allocated while I was syncing. Um, and it caused a data loss. So that was a problem for us. We couldn't afford to have them data loss, of course. <clears throat> so the big question, which tool did we choose? Well, surprisingly, we chose rsync, this marvelous tool from 1996. It's a bright new technology. And we did it because we took a mixed approach. We basically did online plus offline. So we put our sync uh, to continually synchronize all the information. And um, then we went offline. And it took around 40 minutes to completely sync the remaining information. And this, uh, this time also gave, uh, gave some time to Mongo uh, to uh, put his act together, and there were no data loss, and everything was marvelous. So almost everything was there. So now it was time for G day, or, well, maybe she night because we did it at night. So G night. Which, when was she night? She night was the 25th of July, 2018, 11 p.m. UTC plus two. So we gathered the team at the office, ready for a massive switch from um, the existing platform, the existing provider uh, to the new one. We migrated or closed the gates so database and data were able to be migrated in that, those roughly 40 minutes. We tested a lot. We massively tested uh, that everything was uh, working fine. Uh, again, there are like 20 plus carriers back then. You need to test a lot of uh, means or ways of, of connecting to them, several payment options, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It took us around six hours to be sure that everything was working. Six hours of offline. This is pure downtime of all of Packlink. And we were live again. Now, we opened the gates, and of course, it came the aftermath. Um, so the aftermath was actually connecting to SMTP, because apparently connecting to SMTP from GCP is a bit special. And it's a bit special because port 25 and port 465, they were blocked. We weren't able to access our email provider. Uh, so we actually used Gmail, which was easily accessible. I don't wonder why. Uh, and we used that to send some, some emails. Uh, not transactional emails, not uh, just, yes, we had to connect to a carrier through email um, at, as part of the integration. And yes, that apparently was it. That was the release night, having to connect to Gmail. It was that smooth. 
there were no, no last minute fights except that, that SMTP, no firefighting. The result of more than one year worth of work was a perfect release. Having only that problem uh, by such a massive switch, it's, it's a perfect release uh, for me. So, but this is just part of the story. This is just part of the story, of course, because uh, what's, uh, what's under the hood? What's, where's all the code that's, that's making this work? So how does it look today, um, all of Backlink's infrastructure? Well, the output of this year of work were basically 98 Ansible roles and 14 Terraform modules powering all of our infrastructure as code, um, uh, culture, technique, strategy, whatever you, are, you would like to call it. Um, so in, in, in some sample of the Terraform code that we, that we put uh, and that we currently use, uh, here we have a, a sample of uh, a backend service, a default backend service uh, for any, any given microservice. We use uh, on our Terraform, on our Terraform um, repositories, we use software development techniques uh, to evolve our infrastructure. We use uh, the code owner, we use pre commit, uh, maybe some linters. And uh, so this, this gives us the possibility to upgrade, for example, our load balancers to add some custom headers and uh, do it through a commit and propagate this change to station and, um, and to production as a matter of fact. There is no special effort to do anything uh, there. Um, <clears throat> and we also handle accesses. Uh, to the different parts of our infrastructure and accesses to the different parts of uh, Google services through code, through uh, commits and, and, and code changes. So this gives us a lot of control and a lot of um, uh, visibility in what we're doing and actually being more, uh, more close to software development than to a standard or uh, more uh, traditional operations. But there is more. There is much more here on, on the benefits uh, that we, we got from, all, from this decision. It's a bit bold, having a small team. We have fully dockerized local environments that you can have uh, ready in a day. Have you any problem uh, with your current setup? Uh, new people joining Packling, they can have code in production in, in around a week. Our station environments we, now we are taking around four hours to create them from scratch. Before we were taking a week, or around 40, uh, 40 working hours. Now we are taking four hours to build from scratch an, uh, a testing environment. This means that if any given environment starts giving, giving problems, probably it's, more ch it's cheaper to build it from scratch than to actually debug and see what's happening. It's a tenth of the time. All changes of our infrastructure, Air and Git, plus Git have, and of course, cost and inventory are under control. But there's still more, of course. So this unlocked a full BI rewrite. Uh, our BI um, infrastructure, so to speak, uh, we're living on a, on a third party. So if we did this switch around the 25th of July, the 26th of July, we were rewriting the full BI. And we, and we did a rewrite uh, from scratch in six months, this time working with, uh, with a Google partner in this case. Uh, in six months, we rebuilt the whole pipeline, pipeline. We put a proper ETL in place using all the tools that Google provides, and we achieved an 81% cost reduction uh, on, on, on VI. Uh, if you want to know more about this specific, uh, a specific project, you can go to cloud.google.com slash customers slash backlink. There you have a success case where you have all the figures and all the, all the details uh, from this case. Uh, however, with all the benefits we, can, we, we have, we should evolve. We shouldn't stay static and, and live off of the success. So what's, what's for us tomorrow? So what, what do we want to do, to do now? 
what do we want to evolve, how do we want to evolve. First, we want to increase the use of managed services. In the past, we weren't, we weren't using managed services uh, because the provider were not providing many, and uh, we, uh, the service that it provided, well, we didn't see really the benefits. But now, in our new provider in Google, uh, there are a lot of benefits on the services uh, they provide. So we want to increase our usage of them. Uh, we are aware that this might increase our dependency on this new provider. Um, however, it's a, tr it's a trade off. We are trading uh, more, more on dependency uh, for, for, for other benefits. We have to update our microservices and our tooling to avoid having a hybrid model. Remember, small team, one of the limitations we had it were that we weren't able to actually do changes in our microservices. So this means that now, today, we have um, the microservices using uh, uh, some stuff on the, on the old provider and some tooling is still living there. So uh, that means that we have to change uh, software uh, in order to use the services on the new, on the new provider. And we want to fully automate our delivery pipeline. Uh, we automate the configuration part, but we still have to automate all, all the delivery pipeline. And we want to automate from microservice creation to deployments, which today uh, are manual. And we also have to move to a state-of-the-art containers. Uh, remember, we were working, or we are working with uh, non-native Docker Swarm. Uh, this is because, because uh, when we started, uh, actually not even Docker Compose existed. Um, so it worked until now, but now we have to move to either Kubernetes, Docker Swarm Native, OpenShift, or uh, whatever other tool uh, we, we find in the market. And if everything goes fine, uh, maybe I'm here next year talking to you, to you about our experience moving to uh, another container orchestrator. So, um, after all, all this talk, uh, all this experience I'm, uh, uh, I just told you, what can you get from this story? Well, first, migrating is a long and complex, and complex project. You will need commitment from all of the engineering team and commitment from the company, uh, not only because you will be locking some of uh, the um, team members of the, of the engineering team, but also in, term of, in terms of, of budget. And of course, this is not just a matter of, of the ops that dev team is part, it's, it's a matter for the engineering team, because you are doing a change that will affect probably um, uh, the tooling you, you use and will unlock a lot of possibilities. Um, even for major players back then, it was hard to find a partner to support us on automation. Maybe today is not the case. Maybe today partners have evolved and they will happily support you uh, cranking out some uh, Terraform code or some cloud formation code. Um, but this is important because if you don't have the muscle or you have to learn to code in, in, in these tools, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge um, learning curve. Also, our cost of migration was relatively low. Cost of migration is, uh, is a concept that I found uh, way more flexible than vendor lock-in. Uh, that was a, uh, what, what I was using uh, at the beginning of the talk. Because cost of migration actually represents that the more managed services you use, um, the, most, the, the more it's going to cost you move away from your current provider. You can always, always decide uh, to use RabbitMQ, for example, instead of SQS. You are using SQS because it gives you some advantages. It's easy to set up. To set up. You don't have to maintain it. But if you decide to move away of uh, AWS, you will have to pay the price of changing your software to use any other, um, any other queuing uh, mechanism. So basically, the fact that we were not depending on managed services made, uh, made our move to be much faster and cost-effective for us. And one last thing, and I think it's not the, last, the least important of all these, and it's uh, basically, you might be, might be wondering 
how much people were involved in this project, which were the people that actually coded these 90 or 98 roles, all these 14 Terraform modules. And they were actually only two people. I think they are sitting over there. Um, so if you have questions about the creepy details of all this, uh, they were the champions of this great project, uh, bringing um, all of our infrastructure in uh, the new provider. Not saying it's the perfect thing, it's what we had at the time, um, but, but they did it. So now, sorry, it's time for publicity. We are hiring. If you want to join this amazing team that we are growing, just please come by to our stand. And, and, if, and if you are happy uh, at, your current, uh, at your current job, you can pass anyway, have some, have some candies, and some talk to our amazing team. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Questions? Um, I thank you for the talk. Uh, question: How uh, cost change? How infrastructure cost changed uh, after migration? I mean. Uh, what, uh, what, what it, it was cost, cost reduced after moving from a middle sized cloud provider to Google Cloud provider? Um, actually, uh, yes. Um, so, one of the great things was that we were able to, uh, to, to do a full, um, how you say it, um, a full prototype of the cost structure with, uh, uh, with Google, and it was. Uh, more or less the same, but then with reality, actually, with all the traffic we had and everything, uh, it was less money. It's, it actually cost less in the, in, in the new provider in Google. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hello. What would you do differently the second time if you would have to migrate again? Sorry, a bit louder. Yeah, sure. Uh, what uh, uh, if you would have to migrate again now? Yes. What would you do differently this time? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, mm, probably we'll take uh, we'll um, spend some more time. Uh, we'll try not to have this. Uh, this depth by having microservices not changed, because now uh, you, uh, we have to prioritize to, to do this change instead of other needed things. So one of the things that uh, that probably changed would be, um, um, you know, okay, so maybe a year is not enough. Maybe we have to take a year and a half. Yeah. Welcome. Um, the two people that were uh, doing the whole migration, um, were they only doing the implementation or were they all, uh, also doing the uh, conception of the migration? Uh, what do you mean by conception, sorry? Uh, researching uh, for tools, uh, planning uh, which tools should do which job in the whole thing. Okay. Uh, yes, they were part of, the, uh, of that also. They did the whole thing, yeah. How many virtual machines did you have? Three. How many virtual machines did you have in the first place to migrate? Oh, sorry again. The virtual machines. How many did you have? Ah, sorry. Uh, right now or at the time? Uh, at the time when you were uh, beginning. Roughly after after the cleanup, roughly 160. More or less that. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, any more? No. Okay, thank you very much, Edu. Yeah.